Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Grand Rounds. It is my pleasure to introduce one of our own for our McLean Forum, Dr. Stephanie Valcourt. For those of you who don't know her, she's the medical director on AB2, which is our schizophrenia and bipolar disorders unit here at McLean Hospital. She has a long-standing interest in antipsychotic medications that first developed when she studied antipsychotic prescribing patterns here at McLean as a volunteer and later as a research assistant under the mentorship of Dr. Franca Centorino. Um, she attended medical school at Georgetown, completed her residency in psychiatry here at MGH in McLean, and served as chief resident on AB2. She's now in her, her fifth year as an attending on AB2, and her current clinical interests focus on the management of side effects of antipsychotics, including weight gain, and more recently, as you're going to hear about today, clozapine-induced myocarditis. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Valcourt. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here today. This is a clinically inspired talk. In our work on AB2, we treat patients with psychotic disorders, many of whom start and benefit tremendously from clozapine. Over the past several years, we've collectively seen a number of cases of myocarditis, motivating us to understand it better, to recognize it early, and to collaborate with internal medicine to create guidelines for monitoring. My hope in talking about clozapine-induced myocarditis is really to open the conversation to the McLean community such that we actually feel more comfortable prescribing clozapine and we can all collaborate in monitoring for this rare but serious side effect. My objectives are to provide context for how to think about myocarditis and weighing benefits and risks of clozapine use. I'll review clinical and laboratory features of clozapine-induced myocarditis as well as existing guidelines for monitoring. Later, I'll present the current iteration of an AB2 monitoring protocol. And lastly, we'll consider future avenues together to minimize risk going forward. By way of an outline, we'll start with what may seem like a departure, reviewing the history of clozapine's approval in the US and known benefits and risks of clozapine use. We'll take a deep dive into clozapine-induced myocarditis, looking at incidence trends, clinical features and treatment, existing monitoring guidelines and their criticisms, present data from case reports on AB2, share current consensus guidelines on AB2 as to how we're thinking about it now, speak to some ongoing research in the division, and then regarding revisiting benefits and risks of clozapine, I'd like to deliver a really careful message today. We absolutely should prescribe clozapine and feel comfortable prescribing it safely. So I wanted to start this talk by providing some greater context to the risk of myocarditis in treatment with clozapine and how it fits in. This conversation of weighing risks and benefits of clozapine and deciding that its risks can be managed and its benefits outweigh its risks is not a new one. The history of clozapine's entry into the United States really emphasizes that, and I think it's worth reviewing altogether today. And so we begin our history lesson. Clozapine was developed in 1958, not too long after chlorpromazine came along in 1952, when a number of tricyclic compounds based on the chemical structure of the antidepressant amipramine were being synthesized. They were known as tricyclic antidepressants, but with neuroleptic properties, and clozapine was one of them. Early on, laboratory and animal testing revealed similarities to chlorpromazine, but also something unique about clozapine. It did not tend to cause catalepsy or involuntary loss of motor function in animals. It was considered atypical insofar as it showed efficacy without motor side effects, unlike other available in developing antipsychotics. And it really helped to uncouple the idea at the time that extrapyramidal effects went in tandem with antipsychotic efficacy. Its human studies actually had mixed results. The first one failed to show an antipsychotic effect, and then three subsequent trials were successful, such that it had clearly demonstrated an antipsychotic effect in over 100 patients by the mid-1960s. It was used widely throughout Europe in the early 1970s, and at the same time, the manufacturing company Sandoz at the time, now Novartis, began the process of seeking FDA approval in the United States, and this was short-lived. Its agranulocytosis risk emerged in 1975 when a cluster of 16 patients in southwestern Finland developed agranulocytosis, eight of whom died. 
It was withdrawn from general use in all countries, and it was dropped from U.S. development at the time. In 1977, a Sandoz-sponsored group looked at the 16 cases in Finland and highlighted that all cases occurred within the first three months of clozapine use, and all deaths were due to secondary infection in patients with agranulocytosis. They proposed that these cases could be prevented with weekly white blood cell counts, daily body temperatures, and routine monitoring for signs of infection during the first 18 weeks of clozapine therapy. In the late 1970s and 80s, clozapine remained available as a courtesy product in countries throughout Europe where it had already been marketed, and it was available on a compassionate need basis for U.S. patients and doctors for folks who hadn't responded to other treatments. Far from being dropped and unavailable, clozapine use actually expanded during that time for patients considered to have treatment refractory schizophrenia, and word spread in the psychiatric community about its unique efficacy in patients who remained quite symptomatic on other treatments. Clozapine's unique efficacy became more apparent. Sandoz submitted a new drug application in 1983, and the FDA was very supportive of the application, encouraging the development of what it saw to be an important new medication. It asked for a well-designed trial to demonstrate not only that clozapine worked, but that it worked better than existing therapies, along with a plan to manage the risk of agranulocytosis. The study began in 1984 in 16 sites across the United States, and eligibility criteria were qu quite strict. Patients had to have trialed at least three antipsychotic agents previously with limited benefit or failure to respond, and they had to have completed a prospective single-blind trial of haloperidol for six weeks, the mean dose of which was up to 61 milligrams per day, with subsequent lack of improvement in their symptoms. If then eligible, they could be randomized to a double-blind protocol of clozapine or chlorpromazine over six weeks. Within the first week alone, clozapine showed clear superiority over chlorpromazine, with an increasing response still rising at the end of the six-week trial. The study by John Kane and colleagues was convincing enough to the FDA, and clozapine was finally approved by the FDA in September of 1989, entering the U.S. market in February of 1990 as a bundled package with CPMS, or the Clozeral Patient Management System, to ensure weekly blood draws. The story doesn't end there. The bundled package of clozapine plus CPMS was quite costly, upwards of $9,000 a year, with a significant profit to the drug company, and it was a big barrier to its use. Physicians wanted to use it. A number of states brought antitrust actions against the drug company, and from the federal ruling, the medication and monitoring were unbundled, and Medicaid programs were mandated to pay for clozapine and its monitoring costs. All told, from its development in 1958, it took 31 years to get clozapine approved in the United States, and even longer for it to become widely available to the patients who needed it. That it took 31 years with increasing use despite known risks and determination from both the psychiatric community and the FDA that alone speaks to how uniquely effective it is. The benefits of clozapine were universally thought to outweigh significant risks, especially once those risks became quite manageable and preventable. As we talk about myocarditis, the story is no different. Clozapine still uniquely is effective. It has a crucial place in the treatments we offer. The benefits outweigh the risks, and the risks can be managed. Fast forward a bit to now. How do we currently think about the role of clozapine in the treatment of psychotic disorders? It has two primary indications. Folks meet criteria for having treatment-resistant schizophrenia if they have functional impairment in the context of at least moderate severity positive symptoms after having two or more trials of other antipsychotics. This is thought to encapsulate about 30% of the population of folks with schizophrenia. Its second indication is for recurrent suicidal behavior in schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorders. There have been a couple of mirror image studies to demonstrate this, one of which revealed an 85% decrease in suicide attempts following a switch to clozapine. The INTERCEPT, or International Suicide Prevention Trial, randomized patients to, who had schizophrenia with high risk of suicide to clozapine or olanzapine. Those randomized to clozapine attempted suicide less than those in the olanzapine group. And while not a formal indication, clozapine is also well recognized to have a unique role in treatment for patients with sensitivity to extrapyramidal symptoms from, uh, from antipsychotics and patients with tardive dyskinesia. It has a number of well-established and significant benefits, most often seen over the course of a six-month or longer period of treatment, including lower all-cause mortality, which was demonstrated in the Danish FIN-11 study of patients prescribed antipsychotics over 10 years. And a major contributing factor to this is the reduction in death by, by suicide. 
It also has demonstrated superiority for treating positive symptoms, as well as carrying a lower risk for tardive dyskinesia and some potential for treatment in folks who have tardive dyskinesia. Patients taking clozapine may experience improvement in cognition and domains of verbal fluency, declarative memory, attention, and speeded mental functions, which can tra translate into improved work and social function. And folks who take clozapine may stay on it longer with lower relapse rates and improved quality of life. And that's been demonstrated in three-year follow-up with most of the improvements seen over the first three months of use. The benefits of clozapine are dramatic, and in many cases, life-saving. I just reviewed all of this to underscore that we have, we can, and we should continue to use clozapine and to use it safely. So with that, we'll move on to consider some of the risks of clozapine use and where myocarditis fits in. Certainly a comprehensive review of the risks of clozapine is outside of the scope of this presentation. As you can see, myocarditis is one of the more serious side effects associated with its use. What all of these have in common is our ability to monitor for them so that we can intervene early, optimize the benefits of clozapine use over time, and minimize the risks. Myocarditis is no exception to that. I know we all have different training backgrounds and areas of expertise, and of course as psychiatrists we're generally not in the position to manage cardiac conditions, so I thought it would be helpful to take a moment to define myocarditis and how it is typically thought about in the medical community so we can be on the same page. Myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle, an influx of inflammatory cells into the heart wall. There are a number of causes of myocarditis, including viral causes, adverse drug reactions, and autoimmune conditions. The most common viral causes are those associated with upper respiratory tract infections, like adenovirus. It's less commonly associated with bacterial infections, though has been associated with staph, strep, and Lyme infections rarely. In terms of adverse drug reactions, causes include chemotherapeutic agents like anthracyclines, antibiotics like penicillin and sulfonamides, and some anti-seizure medications. Autoimmune conditions have also been associated, associated with it, for example, lupus. Symptoms, as we generally think about myocarditis in the medical community, are known to include chest pain, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, irregular heart rates, and sudden loss of consciousness. If left untreated, complications can include heart failure, if it causes damage to the heart muscles so that blood can't pump effectively, heart attack or stroke, if the heart can't pump blood effectively, the blood, blood that pools in, pools in your heart can form clots, and then rapid or abnormal heart rhythms or arrhythmias. Damage to the heart myocardium can impact the conduction system. Treatment really depends on the cause of the symptoms, and, those will, and we'll talk about treatment for clozapine-induced myocarditis specifically in a little bit. This is not a new phenomenon. The first case was reported in 1980 in the Journal of the Danish Medical Association. It was a suspected overdose in a 22-year-old gentleman who died, thought to be due to clozapine overdose, though only a fraction of a milligram of clozapine was actually recovered by gastric lavage. Thereafter, there were a number of isolated case reports. In 1999, a pivotal paper described 15 cases of myocarditis, five of which were fatal, all occurring within three weeks of starting clozapine. All cases were reported to the Australian Adverse Reaction Reporting Program, increasing awareness in Australia in particular, where many of the case series reviews and guidelines have been initiated. This attracted a lot of attention, especially with the high mortality rate in that group and increased awareness of the need for some monitoring. Time passes and more cases are reported to Australia's Central Reporting Program. In 2011, another major paper comes along, again authored by an Australian group, who included a set of monitoring guidelines for detection based on clinical features of 75 cases then that had been reported. This set of guidelines has really been the one evidence-based monitoring algor algorithm to follow since its introduction, with more recent groups proposing subtle changes, as we'll see. The introduction of these guidelines not only further increased awareness, but gave providers some confidence that they could detect myocarditis. With the introduction of these papers over the years, we've seen what appears to be an increased incidence of clozapine-induced myocarditis. Rates now seem to be settling in at 1% to 3% versus the 1% or less that had been previously thought, with rates as high as 8.5% reported in one study in Australia. For Australia in particular, it's been debated whether they have a higher incidence because of genetic or environmental factors, but that really hasn't panned out, and it seems likely that they have a better case detection rate due to early centralized reporting and increased awareness. As we'll see, it's not a dissimilar trend from our experience in the United States. 
So here we see the increased incidence of myocarditis in Australia over time since 1993 with the likely impact of those papers. So between 1993 and 1999, there were less than five cases annually. After the 1999 paper describing 15 cases with the then 33% mortality rate, we certainly start to see more cases reported. After the 2011 paper that included this specific monitoring protocol, you see even more cases. Importantly, despite the increased incidence, the reported number of mortalities has overall remained stable, likely re reflecting the, protect the protective benefit of monitoring. What do we see if we look at trends in the United States? This is data from the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System public dashboard. The data include a total of 949 cases, 947 of which were considered serious, and 177 of which resulted in death. You see a similar trend here, that there have been more cases reported to the FDA since the Australian protocol was published in 2011. However, the reported number of mortalities has not increased despite an apparently considerable increased incidence. What's going on here? We're detecting it more and we're catching it early. What have we seen on our unit, AB2, a unit that focuses on the treatment of psychosis to include initiation of clozapine for a number of our patients? In the absence of a true incidence rate at this point, we're definitely seeing more cases. For years, we have followed a version of the 2011 monitoring protocol with some necessary adaptations. Most recently, perhaps because we're following this, mon this monitoring protocol a little bit more rigorously, we've seen several cases per year. In 2018, we saw a cluster of cases in the spring that included two diagnosed on the same day. So at this point, we're detecting it. We know we're seeing it more. And we've been really motivated to understand it better and optimize our monitoring strategies. To this point of detection, how do we know it when we see it? In general, clozapine-induced myocarditis is diagnosed in the setting of symptoms, lab abnormalities, and high suspicion. It's not based on any of one of these parameters alone. So let's review what we know about each of these in a bit more depth. To do so, we go back to Australia, where they've reviewed lots of cases. Much of what we're about to review is from these two papers here, which likely have some overlap in their patient populations as they're both based in Australia and they share authorship. The 2007 paper on the bottom reviews clinical findings in 116 cases, and the 2011 paper on the top nicely compares cases to controls. In terms of demographics, no exciting differences emerge. While it may seem that it, like it might be perhaps more common in males based on these numbers, it didn't reach the level of significance in 116 cases here. The N is pretty low, and I haven't seen any gender effect clearly documented in the literature. When do we see it? Well, this is clearly documented. There is a danger period of sorts, with the highest risk of myocarditis coinciding with the first four weeks of treatment. The highest risk is consistently reported during the third week, peaking at days 17 to 21, or an average of day 19. Because this has been so consistently replicated, it has laid the foundation for suggested weekly lab monitoring during the first four weeks of treatment in particular. What do patients experience for symptoms for myocarditis? It's myocarditis. Inflammation of the heart muscle must lead to chest pain, right? No. Let's uncouple that association right now. Chest pain occurs, though it occurs in a minority of patients with, clause, with, with myocarditis from clozapine. So asking about chest pain is not adequate screening for myocarditis. What do folks, folks experience? Well, it's really nonspecific, much more in the way of vague flu-like symptoms that can affect a variety of organ systems. They feel unwell. There is actually a suggestion in the 2011 monitoring guideline to ask patients to report if they are feeling unwell. Here are some of the various symptoms that have been associated with myocarditis from clozapine. Cough, chest pain, shortness of breath, sore throat, myalgias, headache, sweatiness, gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and genital urinary systems, symptoms including urinary discomfort and urinary frequency. So unwell is actually a good description, and anecdotally, it's what we've seen patients experience and report. Beyond asking about symptoms, what signs can we monitor for? I think this figure is super helpful, albeit lacking in resolution a bit. Obviously, the most common helpful signs are those that are going to really discriminate cases from controls. So those that do seem to be troponin, CRP, echo, and fever. 
Troponin greater than two times the upper limit of normal is really super helpful. That's one of the more specific signs occurring in about 90% of cases. CRP greater than 100 is also fairly specific, though you can see this to a degree in some folks without, in the absence of myocarditis as well. Abnormal echo findings, unsurprisingly, are really specific, assuming a normal echo prior to clozapine initiation. And then fever, greater than 100.4, really stands apart as one of the more specific signs. It's not to be ignored in a patient who recently started clozapine. Again, to emphasize, you see here that a slight minority of people experience chest pain with myocarditis, and it's not an adequate screening assessment. Putting this together, what are the most helpful monitoring parameters, and what has been shown not to be helpful? We just reviewed that troponin, CRP, echo, and fever may be the most helpful. What's not helpful, chest x-ray as a screening tool has not been shown to be helpful, and sed rate has not been shown to be helpful, or ESR. Eosinophilia may not occur at all, and if it does, it actually tends to occur up to seven days after peak troponin levels. We'll get to eosinophils in a, eosinophils in a minute as they relate to mechanism. Sinus tachycardia is seen in most cases, though it's, it's associated with clozapine use as a physiological effect, um, and it's really considered to be nonspecific, although with myocarditis we can see a jump in heart rate beyond what we've already seen as well discuss. EKG findings are equivocally helpful, though if completed seriously, may, serially may demonstrate changes from baseline that can increase suspicion in a helpful way for myocarditis and support a need for echo. What do we see in terms of EKG changes? Sinus tachycardia and nonspecific ST segment or T wave changes are the most common abnormalities seen. You can also see overt ischemic changes, including T wave inversions and ST segment changes. And if there's pericardial involvement, you can see PR depression with ST elevation. With an effusion, you can see low voltage, and you can also see conduction abnormalities. To summarize, EKG findings tend to be nonspecific, though can increase suspicion for myocarditis if and when changes occur. There are a couple of other cardiac imaging modalities that can be helpful. So as we just saw, echo changes are one of the most specific signs for myocarditis. With echo changes, you may see left ventricular, biventricular cardiac dysfunction, as well as a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Echoes should be used as primary monitoring tools and as tools for follow-up to document resolution of dysfunction. You should see improvement in left ventricular function after clozapine discontinuation, typically as early as several days to a week of stopping it. Cardiac MRI may also be helpful, especially when blood tests or echo results are inconclusive. They do have a high diagnostic accuracy for myocarditis, and they're used with gadolinium. So a myocarditis diagnosis on MRI would require either T1 images with early gadolinium enhancement from edema or late gadolinium enhancement from, from fibrosis. Alternatively, on T2-weighted images, you can see increased signal intensities. This image is from a case of clozapine-induced myocarditis. The echo in this case showed slight global hypokinesia of the left ventricle and a one centimeter circumferential pericardial effusion. GAD-enhanced MRI showed a left ventricular ejection fraction of, 30, of 43% and this area of myocardial edema there in the wall. MRIs can also be helpful to understand why some folks aren't getting better after clozapine has been discontinued and they've received treatment in the event that they have an area of fibrosis, for example. Endomyocardial biopsy is the most definitive way of diagnosing myocarditis and has given us more in insight into the underlying mechanism. That said, it's generally avoided for obvious reasons, including risks of bleeding, arrhythmias, PE, and right ventricular perforation. And if you happen to biopsy the wrong site, you miss focal myocarditis, myocarditis anyway. Mechanistically, myocarditis is thought to be a type 1 drug hypersensitivity reaction with a similar mechanism to what you might see with hay fever or allergic conjunctivitis. In biopsied myocardium, the cells are consistent with that. You generally see a predominance of eosinophils along with a mixed inflammatory infiltrate. Eosinophilia, eosinophils, seen here with their characteristic little bilobe nuclei, are a type of white blood cell, the cells that support our immune system and help us with allergies and some infections. They're pro-inflammatory, so having too many of them, especially in one area, can cause pain and even cell death. 
Other clinical features of myocarditis are in line with type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, including an early presentation in the course of treatment and the necessity of drug discontinuation in treatment. So we've diagnosed myocarditis. What do we do to treat it? Clozapine needs to be discontinued. Universal recommendation. Other medicines to support cardiac function and limit the risk of heart failure include beta, block beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and diuretics. Of these, beta blockers may be especially helpful to improve ventricular function and increase survival rates. Left ventricular function, if impaired, typically is restored quickly after stopping clozapine and providing supportive treatment. All this to say that myocarditis is detectable and treatable. Nevertheless, what you read in the literature is a surprisingly high mortality rate that is not in line with recent adverse drug reporting data we reviewed earlier, and from everything I can gather, may be a true overestimation, especially in light of improved detection. There are no remarkable features that distinguish fatal cases from non-fatal cases, although it is generally accepted that the earlier you catch it, the more treatable it is without progression to heart failure. Is rechallenge possible? That is to say, if someone has had myocarditis from clozapine, can it ever be retrialed again in that person? Well, it has been done. It's not universally supported in the literature, though with some, some authors arguing it should not be done at all. There are 19 cases for which rechallenge has been reported. The time to rechallenge is pretty variable, from several weeks after stopping clozapine to uh, beyond two years later. There may be a possible benefit of a slower titration rate based on successful cases. There's been a success in 12 of the 19 case reports. The other seven develop signs and symptoms consistent with myocarditis on retrial. Obviously, this requires more frequent lab and echo monitoring. And troponins may be done as often as three times per week, and echo is once a week in patients retrialed on clozapine after experiencing myocarditis with it. An extensive discussion of the risks and benefits is necessary with the patient and the family. Cardiologists consider the recurrence of myocarditis in these cases to be likely. In cases reference cardiology consultation and supervision. To my knowledge, this has not been done on AB2, and I'd be curious to hear if anyone has had experience with it. But in reviewing the literature and weighing the overall risks and benefits, we can make a compelling argument that this would certainly best be done in a med psych unit with cardiology closely involved. Putting this all together, I think this is a really helpful timeline. So at step one, a patient initiates clozapine. The titration is underway for the first two to three weeks, and we do see a heart rate elevation by 10 to 20 beats per minute that's unrelated to myocarditis and thought to be related to the physiological effects of clozapine. At point two, patient experiences onset of, of symptoms of respiratory, gastrointestinal, or urinary tract infection, and their CRP is a bit elevated. They continue clozapine. Their heart rate goes up by another 20 to 30 beats per minute. Their CRP is further elevated, and then they develop an elevation in their troponin along with a change in their EKG. At point three, with the elevated troponin or considerably elevated CRP or documentation of cardiac impairment by echo, clozapine is discontinued. Several days later, they receive supportive therapy and their left ventricular function is improved typically within a week or so in most cases. I've superimposed some lab data to emphasize that CRP is the earliest lab abnormality that we see, followed by elevations in troponin and changes in EKG. Eosinophilia, again, is not a specific sign for, for myocarditis and generally is not recommended for monitoring. That was a typical course. Asymptomatic courses are atypical quite uncommon, though they have been described and should be included in this talk. Specifically, six cases were reported to the Australian Adverse Event Reporting System. We're talking small fractions of a percentage point of overall incidence. Of those six cases, three cases were unfortunately fatal, with some concern raised by the authors that CRPs were only mildly elevated prior to the fatality. There are a lot of caveats here. The main barrier, I think, to our ability to interpret this is study design, a retrospective review of cases that themselves have limited data. Perhaps these patients were not asked about symptoms, and that's why they're considered asymptomatic. We just don't know. Nevertheless, these cases introduce the possibility of asymptomatic myocarditis for our patients 
which, yes, is scary, and at the same time, we can learn from it. It emphasizes the importance of close monitoring for signs of myocarditis, the lab data, and the vital sign changes themselves if our patients may not experience symptoms. Here's the monitoring guideline introduced by the Australian group in 2011. Patient starts clozapine and at baseline undergoes a check of troponin, CRP, and echo. There's then close monitoring, they suggest at least every second day uh, for the first 28 days. Certainly on inpatient units, we have the ability to monitor much more closely than that. And then on days 7, 14, 21, and 28, rechecking a CRP and troponin. At the same time, it's important to ask patients if they're feeling unwell with those vague, nonspecific signs that we dis symptoms that we discussed earlier. Thank you, General. So in patients starting clozapine, this is the rec recommended monitoring algorithm. Thank you. And then if the patient develops signs or symptoms of unspecified illness, those vague symptoms, a heart rate greater than 120 or increased by 30 beats per minute or more, an elevated CRP in the range of 50 to 100, or mildly elevated troponin less than two times the upper limit of normal, you continue clozapine with increased monitoring, generally daily troponin and CRP monitoring. If they develop considerably elevated troponins greater than two times the upper limit of normal or CRP greater than 100, the recommendation was to discontinue clozapine, repeat echo, and consult a cardiologist. So again, those were introduced in 2011. There are main evidence-based recommendations, um, and there have been subtle changes, which we'll talk about in a moment, and we've tried to apply this algorithm um, in the best way we can on the unit in the absence of having available echoes in the moment. The practical concerns with this monitoring guideline um, have been emphasized. While tremendously helpful, this guideline was criticized primarily because of the recommendation that all patients undergo an echo at baseline, which introduces significant logistical barriers as well as cost barriers to both inpatient and outpatient use when clozapine is already thought to be underutilized. With criticism to those guidelines come recommendations for new guidelines. Most recently in 2008, there was a new recommendation that echoes should be done only in high-risk patients. These authors concluded that CRP and troponin monitoring is likely to be helpful for symptomatic patients, though the utility of routine screening for asymptomatic patients wasn't known. So this guideline included baseline EKG, echo in patients at high risk, and then a low threshold for initiating the lab monitoring. There's been a lack of consensus on how best to monitor for myocarditis in the literature. We have some guidelines, they're changing. And this is the context in which we start to see more cases on EV2. So I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about some cases we've discussed in more depth. So the first case is a young man in his mid-20s with schizoaffective disorder, depressed. The patient was experiencing voices that were really threatening, uh, as well as some distressing beliefs, including Capgras delusions. He had a past medical history of hypertension, and he was on nifedipine. Clozapine was started, and within four days, the patient reported feeling better with a reduction in, in his experience of voices. It was up titrated to 200 milligrams at a rate of 25 milligrams per day. On day 11, he reported some right cheek swelling and some allergy symptoms. He was prescribed some allergy medication. And then on day 12, he actually reported chest pain. He had experienced chest pain in the past, uh, which was pre-existing and described as feeling as though someone was squeezing his chest. On day 13, he reported flank pain and nausea. Labs at that time were ordered. And on day 14, he reported nasal congestion with labs returning with an elevated troponin of 21 and an elevated, of, elevated CRP of 82.2. At that point, he was sent out to a local outside hospital where subsequent labs included an elevated D-dimer, EKG with ST elevation, uh, chest x-ray was normal, and CT chest was negative for a PE. He was admitted to the unit. He stayed there for two days at the outside hospital. Clozapine was stopped. The next day, an echo showed mild concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, except traced to small pericardial effusion. No medications were introduced there by way of cardiac support. Troponin peaked at 63, uh, and CRP had actually already peaked at McLean. He returned to McLean after staying at the outside hospital for two days, where CRP normalized and troponin downtrended but never normalized. It was still elevated at 16. 
He was started on olanzapine in conjunction with paliperidone palmitate that remained quite symptomatic. He was ultimately transferred to a general medical hospital for ECT to be done there. And here's his EKG, again showing nonspecific T wave abnormalities. Hmm? At that point, he was not. This was when he was on, on clozapine. For a second case, we'll talk about a young man in his mid-20s with schizophrenia, alcohol, and stimulant use disorders. He had actively been drinking prior to arrival and required some chlorodiaz epoxide for withdrawal. He had no significant past medical history. On day 10 of clozapine, he reported body aches and complained of feeling tired. Labs were ordered, and the following day, he reported diarrhea, chills, diaphoresis, and joint pain. His troponins were negative, but his CRP was elevated beyond 50, so with increased suspicion for myocarditis with EKG showing sinus tachycardia of 116. Internal medicine was consulted and clozapine was stopped at that time. He remained on the unit. The next day, he developed chest pain and his heart rate had actually jumped 20 to 30 beats per minute from the previous day. His troponin returned at 105, which is seven and a half times the upper limit of normal, and his chest x-ray was within normal limits. He was sent to an outside hospital he remained there for several days and was followed by psychiatric consultation. His echo was normal, and then they ended up discharging him from the outside hospital. He didn't return to McLean. So this was his first EKG. It's just showing sinus tachycardia. And then the following day, you see EKG changes. Nonspecific T-wave abnormality. Nonspecific T-wave abnormalities were, were new relative to the first one. The third case is more unusual, both in its presentation and its course. This was a young man in his mid-20s with schizoaffective disorder, manic, and cannabis use disorder. He had a past medical history of obesity. On day eight of clozapine use, he reported sim symptoms including nasal congestion and sore throat. On the next day, he reported muscle aches and mild shortness of breath. On day 10, all symptoms had actually improved or resolved. Five days later, he vomited. We ordered some labs, again, knowing that myocarditis can present really nonspecifically. And labs the next day returned with troponins at the upper limit of normal. So normal in, in this assay was less than 0 0.03 and a massively elevated CRP of 146.2. He was sent to an outside hospital at that time where his D-dimer, BNP, and clozapine levels were all quite high. He had a chest CT, which um, demonstrated some small pleural effusions bilaterally with low lung, lung volumes, but no PE. The following day at the outside hospital, he had an echo that showed, uh, that showed left ventricular systolic function mildly impaired with hypokinesis, and his injection fraction was low at 48%. He was ultimately sent to uh, another outside general medical hospital for cardiac MRI. Um, it showed no gadolinium enhancement in the left ventricle to suggest fibrous changes or scarring, but he did have biventricular systolic dysfunction with mildly reduced ejection fractions. He was discharged with a re restricted activity level, instructions not to lift more than five pounds on a low salt diet. He was prescribed metoprolol, so a beta blocker and lisinopril and ACE inhibitor. He continued to meet with a cardiologist and over several months following discharge, his cardiomyopathy was in full remission and his EF was 75%. He remained on the ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. Of note, his cardiologist did obtain a medical history of cardiomyopathy in his mother and valvular heart disease in his maternal grandmother. So this is his EKG with some conduction abnormalities. Putting this all together, what have we seen on the unit? Symptoms are, in fact, nonspecific, vague, flu-like. We've seen a number of cases where CRP elevations are relatively common, even in the absence of symptoms. This has raised the question of, what is the utility of CRPs in monitoring asymptomatic patients again? When they do return elevated, we're responsible for following them, and patients end up with daily CRP labs. No one wants to be on a medication that requires daily labs, so this really becomes a barrier to clozapine use. Symptoms have preceded troponin elevations and EKG changes and have been associated with higher CRP values. 
EKG findings, when we see them, are nonspecific, consistent with the literature. So in general, in AB2, we're seeing what the literature suggests with this question of what is the utility of CRP monitoring when we end up doing daily, daily labs. We've been collaborating closely with the internal medicine team. I'm really happy to see a number of you here today. Uh, we're very grateful for your collaboration in this. And over time, we've collectively developed a set of our own monitoring guidelines. This has been a collaboration with, with us, with medicine, and also an MGH cardiologist. The guidelines that we've developed are really quite similar to the 2011 monitoring algorithm, with some changes based on us being a freestanding psychiatric hospital, and which it may take some time to arrange echoes. And, our, and based on our clinical experience. Our monitoring protocol, as you'll see, does uh, recommend weekly monitoring for the first four weeks. Elimination of the baseline echo that would still be indicated for patients with known cardiac disease or structural abnormalities. Elimination of the weekly CRP, considering that the risks of CRP monitoring in asymptomatic patients may outweigh the benefit, and emphasizes the low threshold for internal medicine consults. Or as Dr. Patty says, there really is no threshold for an internal medicine consult. Here's where we landed. Uh, and again, this is a discussion. And the goal of this talk is to really open this up to the McLean community to think about how we can best monitor for this. So a patient starts clozapine and not baseline. Our monitoring algorithm recommends getting an EKG, CRP, and troponin, so elimination of the echo. Vital signs on the unit are taking it, taken at minimum twice a day. And then we see the weekly monitoring on days 7, 14, 21, and 28 with EKG and troponin. The, the cardiologist we collaborated, Dr. Deck at uh, Mass General, recommended adding on day 60 if a patient happens to be here an EKG and troponin just because late cases can occur. We recommend daily monitoring for fever, shortness of breath or edema, signs of heart failure, and flu-like symptoms by physician judgment. If any of those are present, we recommend ordering as soon as possible CRP. Now we have our symptomatic patient, troponin, EKG, BNP, and consideration for echo. Again, especially low or no threshold to consult internal medicine who likely should be involved at this step of the process. introduce a wrench in the equation, the new high sensitivity troponin assay at a time when we were all comfortable with our, return, our troponins returning less than 0.03 and raising considerable suspicion for myocarditis when higher than that. So the cardiologist we collaborated with, Dr. Deck, cautioned us that it's more challenging to interpret elevations with the new high sensitivity troponin assay. It's 100 times more sensitive than, than the prior assay and we may see troponins likely to be hanging out in the range of one to two times the upper limit of normal. It's really hard to know how best to monitor folks at that point or when they need to be sent out for emergent workup at an outside hospital, and it's really imperative that we involve internal medicine at that point in weighing the decision. Again, the diagnosis of myocarditis is based on symptoms, lab abnormalities, and high suspicion. He also recommended discontinuation of greater than two times the upper limit of normal for troponin value, but under that continued monitoring and, mo and monitoring for serial increases. <clears throat> what are some other risk factors? How can we minimize the risk of our folks developing myocarditis? There's really limited data. Uh, you know, we have limited data overall on cases, um, and it's really hard to tease apart risk factors when the N is overall so small. But there is some data to suggest that there are three risk factors being dose titration rate, concomitant valproic acid, and increasing age. So with regard to dose titration rate, higher cumulative doses in the first nine days may increase risk, with each 250 milligrams increasing risk by 26% relative to baseline risk. Cumulative doses less than 500 milligrams may reduce risk, and cumulative doses greater than 920 milligrams will increase risk. We'll touch on this again in a moment. The only concomitant medication to increase risk in the literature is really valproic acid. The mechanism for this is entirely unclear. It, it was considered maybe that valproic acid could potentiate clozapine and vice versa due to competitive protein binding, but the clozapine plasma concentrations don't really differ with, with valproic acid versus not. Nevertheless, valproic acid in the literature is associated with more than double risk. 
The third factor that may increase risk for myocarditis is increasing age. Uh, each successive decade in age may increase risk by 31 percent, uh, but again, the, the data is really limited. At the same time, I think this raises some important questions if we're really going to emphasize limiting risk for our patients. Might there be a possible benefit to slowing our titration rate? Here at McLean, we often use titration rates at 25 milligrams per day. The clozapine dose titration protocols in Australia actually result in a lower cumulative dose than ours. So with our protocol at that rate, uh, folks would take 1,125 milligrams in the first nine days versus here in Australia, 612.5 or 812.5, depending on which algorithm you choose. It may be something to consider. Perhaps we're seeing more cases in the context of this rate. Uh, again, this is us as a community considering how we can best lower the risk without any, any specific experience to speak to. The other question is when and if to discontinue valproic acid. Currently, a few of us have been tapering off valproic acid when starting clozapine. As you saw in those cases, a couple of those folks had been on valproic acid for the first couple of days of, of treatment. Might we consider tapering it beforehand so that it's really washed out by the time folks start clozapine? That itself would, of course, carry a number of risks, certainly psychiatric exacerbations. Um, their symptoms are, are likely to get worse in the week that we're waiting to start clozapine. All told, there are you know, relative risks and benefits discussion to be had based on the limited data that we have. But it, at the same time, this really inspires ongoing discussions of how we can best limit risk for our patients. I see Dr. Moran here in the audience. I wanted to just mention that we're looking more in depth at some of the cases we've had within partners um, relative to controls who have started clozapine here and not developed myocarditis. So we're hoping this will give us a better sense of what our true incidence rates are, as well as some additional insights into risk factors. So it's a really important question. How can we limit this risk? As promised, we're going to re revisit the benefits of clozapine. It's uniquely efficacious in folks whose symptoms haven't responded to other medications. It has lower all-cause mortality rate and lower risk of suicide and may more effectively treat symptoms for patients with improved quality of life. It has many potential benefits and manageable risks. To summarize, clozapine has an important role in the treatment of schizophrenia. Myocarditis associated with clozapine use is rare, increasingly detected, and should not present a barrier to clozapine use. Risk is greatest during the first four weeks of use. Symptoms tend to be nonspecific and flu-like, less commonly chest pain. The most specific diagnostic studies include troponin, CRP, and ECHO. And case detection and prevention of morbidity and mortality is possible with close monitoring. And I hope that we can continue that discussion. Thank you to all AB2 staff. This has really been a collaborative effort. Internal medicine, Paula Bolton, Drs. Rick Patty, Arthur Siegel, Marion Klebser, Sophie Fort. McLean Pharmacy, Alana Regan and Dave Snyder, uh, cardiologists we collaborated with at MGH, and special thank you to my mentors, Dr. Stucklosa, Dose Dongar, Franca Cinturino, and Baldessarini, and Dr. Baldessarini for your ongoing support and mentorship. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Connery behind you. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. That's a terrific piece of work. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. Um, simple question. Uh, is there a preferred replacement antipsychotic when you have to discontinue abruptly, or is it always a case-by-case -case decision-making process? Great question. It's really been a case-by-case -case in the few cases that we've, we've had and had folks return to the unit off of clozapine, considering their response to other antipsychotic agents and um, you know, their presentation at the time and other medical comorbidities. Thank you again for the thorough uh, talk. And a um, couple of thoughts. You know, as you know, I, I do outpatient. And, uh, you, and that's uh, tricky because I do start the outpatient, especially the one uh, that develop TD, develop, uh, uh, you know, they develop uh, unbearable side effects or they had enough. Of it. So there is that in the long term, even though I agree with you. I have a lot of outpatient on clozapine. I still prescribe it and I will prescribe it. I have to tell you, 
uh, maybe I've been ignorant or maybe don't notice and get, but actually of the patient I started, only few stopped it for whatever reason. So that already tells me maybe the myocarditis has not been a problem, but why? Why in the outpatient not so much? Because I started hundreds of patients, so some must have had. So while you were talking, I was reflecting on that, but outpatient, usually I do an overlap, and I do it extremely slowly, like 12.5, then 25 for a week, 50 for the second week, because again, I don't want to increase it that they are still functioning, driving, doing this, I cannot go so fast as the inpatient. Usually they are not so acute, otherwise I will have had them inpatient if it has to be done fast. So I wonder, because you said the cumulative effect of the dosing, cumulative dosing, and I wonder if uh, really it makes a big difference going extremely slow. You cannot do that in patients sometimes because some administrative pressures and you need to get people out and also they are so acute, you need to dose them. But I wonder if it uh, would be worth uh, thinking of doing uh, more an overlap uh, and um, even slower than that. I'm not sure, a thought. I think it's helpful to consider uh, certainly whether the slower titration rate as an outpatient might be something we could in some way replicate on the unit. Again, the acuity is often um, you know, our, our pressing interest. These folks are really high risk, really symptomatic. We want to help them as much as possible, but maybe with a, a more slow cross taper such that they have another antipsychotic on board while we're introducing it could be helpful. I, I have a quick question back here. Um, the, given that... Uh, Given that we know that schizophrenia alone in treatment with antipsychotics is associated with a 10 to 25 year reduction in lifespan, and the majority of those deaths are due to cardiovascular disease, and we know that almost all antipsychotic medications can induce what we currently call NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is also associated with fever, yet people are never routinely checking CRP or echocardiograms or troponins do we know that this is specific to clozapine and not a class effect? I haven't seen any literature that it is a class effect. Um, you know, certainly clozapine can be tremendously helpful in reducing that mortality rate, um, which is part of the emphasis of, of this talk. Um, I'd be curious if anyone has had uh, experience with myocarditis from other antipsychotic agents, but really, when we think about drugs that may increase the risk or contribute to the risk of myocarditis, clozapine is um, kind of stands apart in the literature as the one that may do so. Um, if anyone has other experience, I'd be curious to hear. I, I guess I'm just wondering if anybody's looked, because if we haven't looked, we haven't seen it. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think folks who are on antipsychotic medications um, and, and remain adherent, uh, or, you know, it, it clearly has demonstrated evidence in the literature to help close that mortality gap, and of, of those antipsychotics, clozapine really stands apart. So any discussion of weighing risks and benefits needs to factor that into consideration, too. Um, it's a good question. Again, this, this is a talk that's going to raise a lot of questions. Hey, thank you. That was a beautiful job. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, Cases that you've had are all men? Yes. And the literature suggests a male predisposition? Another question. And that's pretty solid, is it? It's pretty well. That's a pretty secure finding? More men? I suggest it wasn't significant. The N, the denominator here, is really, really low. Yeah. There aren't that many cases. So perhaps there's a male predominance. Um, you know, I think perhaps we start clozapine uh, more commonly in men. There are a lot of yeah. factors to consider there, but it's sure. another question that, that I've been thinking about, too. The other thing I wondered about is, has anybody looked at any other tissues, gut, bladder, and so on, to look for pathological changes? Or is it just... In question, because it can be associated with polycerositis, so you have to wonder if there are other yeah. um, cirrhosal inflammatory conditions. I haven't seen literature on it, but it's a really good question. Have you done ECT on folks post-myocarditis from cl clozapine? So there, the one case, uh, the first case I presented was a gentleman who um, ended up having ECT uh, at another hospital. Um, 
his troponins were not normal, um, and I'm not sure where they landed in terms of the overlap with ECT, but he did end up getting ECT. That's an important treatment modality, treatment modality to consider. When you know patients haven't responded to other antipsychotics, they're already on clozapine, and they're demonstrating an intolerability to it. Certainly at McLean, it's an interesting question. I think it's something that may be more safely pursued in a general medical hospital. Um, you know, I, I would I imagine anesthesiologists and the ECT psychiatrists may be uncomfortable uh, in someone who's recently had elevated troponins doing ECT here. Yeah. But yeah, there's not very much reported. Got another one over here. Hi, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, one is the medical people, is there any evidence or did you look of whether people were on anti-inflammatories in any particular way in these small number of cases and would it be a reasonable idea to put somebody on standing ibuprofen? I have no idea medically if it's correlated. The second question was, do insurance companies willingly get an echo if you order an echo because somebody is on a medicine that might cause um, myocarditis? I don't know if you had trouble with that. And there was an inference in one of your cases, maybe in Australia, that they switched the person to olanzapine, inferring that olanzapine, which is quite similarly molecularly, does not have the, this incidence. And finally, oh, two things. I assume it's not audible in auscultation with a stethoscope, uh, the mitocarditis. And the other question is, um, uh, what can, can you give us a vague number? Because I do outpatients too, and I want to say something about myocarditis, but I want to say one in 10,000 or one in 1,000 or one in 50,000 because I don't know, even though I know there's not, not that much data. Thanks. There are discrepancies in the general numbers. Um, so more recently, it seems to be lending between one and 3%, although there's some recent data that suggests it may be less common than that. Um, so you're seeing some, some literature say it could be as high as 8.5%. We're detecting it a lot more lately. And then other literature saying it's actually less common, it's less than 1%. Um, so it's really, there's no consensus as to what the actual um, incidence rate may be. Um, there are a lot of questions in the literature here, but I, I think generally we, we would speak to a, a figure of around 1 to 3 percent. Is, is there a partners wide sur surveillance for uh, clozapine myocarditis now? So we have our own monitoring protocol. This is what we've implemented on our unit. Um, and certainly we talk, to, talk amongst ourselves whenever we have elevated suspicion in any regard for myocarditis uh, of those cases. Um, so we have our own monitoring protocol. And then speaking to this study, um, you know, Dr. Moran is gonna look at um, some more um, electronic medical records to get a better sense of the, the overall incidence that we've seen. And um, we'll work with her to think about some risk factors and um, what might increase uh, risk for, for folks starting clozapine here. It's, it's interesting with the historical sweep that you gave us, which was wonderful, that the FDA hasn't put a black box warning on clozapine for this, or have they? Yeah, sorry, does this raise the issue of whether it's wise, especially outpatient people, to uh, get a consent listing these symptoms and risks? In, if it's up to 3%, that's a pretty scary number. So we, we've been talking with folks about the risk since we've seen it more. Certainly that's part of our, our discussion about clozapine. Um, you know, I think with any, any discussion of consent for any treatment, you can think about what you may be likely to see or not. So it could be included for sure. I'm mindful of the time, so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up right now. So let's have another round of applause for Dr. Valcourt. Thank you very much.